All right. So our objective for today is we're going to start talking about pressure. On Wednesday, we were talking about matter, got into discussing the states of matter and how uh, fluids, including liquids and gases, uh, are things that object that solid objects can be submerged in, since the uh, fluids are capable don't have definite shape and therefore are able to flow around objects that you place in them. But those fluids exert pressure on things uh, when uh, fluids exert pressure on things when those solids are submerged in them. And so today we're going to begin discussing pressure, talking about exactly what pressure is and where atmospheric pressure and water pressure come from and what they do. Now, before I give the physics definition of pressure, what do you guys think it means given how it just comes up in common English or how you've possibly used it in science classes before? Volume of force. Okay. Yes, there is force involved. It, uh, when you exert pressure, you are exerting force on something. But there is another requirement, and it's that that force you're exerting is spread over a surface area. And you do this subconsciously every time you exert force with your body, because when you touch something in order to exert force on it, you are applying that force over the surface area of contact, which is very often just the surface area of the palm of your hand. And even though your hand is not a standard geometric shape, it does still have a flat area that you could calculate. And if you wanted to calculate the pressure you were exerting, pressure is defined as force divided by surface area. You exert force over an area, and that tells you pressure. So the capital P here is pressure. Uh, F is still force, and A is area. And again, you are exerting pressure pretty much every time you exert force with your body, because since we are not able to manipulate gravity or telekinesis, we have to physically touch things in order to exert force on them. Therefore, the surface area of contact is the area that that force is delivered over. And as it turns out, your nervous system can't actually detect force. What you detect when something is pressing, like exerting force on your body, what you actually detect is pressure. And I will elaborate on that. Uh, pressure is a new variable, so I'm going to mention that pressure does count as a vector since it does point in a direction. Uh, it inherits the direction of the force. So if I push down, the pressure I'm exerting points downwards. Uh, I'll mention though that pressure always has to, the force involved in a pressure always has to point perpendicularly to the surface it is acting on or alternatively to the surface creating it. Uh, so much like normal force again, we have this perpendicular rule here. In physics, we measure pressure in units of pascals, abbreviated to PA. Uh, one pascal is defined as one newton of force exerted over a one meter squared surface area. So one pascal is just one over one for context. Uh, this, the red box that I've drawn around the tutoring sign, this is one meter squared, one meter by one meter. One pascal of pressure is one newton of force exerted over the entirety of this particular square. One pascal is teeny tiny. You would not notice one pascal of pressure acting on your body. It's a very small unit. For further context, this is the amount of pascals the air pressure is currently exerting on your body. 101,325 pascals is standard atmospheric pressure on this planet. One pascal is nothing. You are used to, at all times, over a thousand pascals crushing your body. So again, just for context. Uh, the imperial unit for pressure, which is to say the American unit, pressure is pounds per square inch, sometimes abbreviated as PSI. 
which is just a different unit of force in a different unit of area. So it's the same thing, again, just a different unit. Any questions with any of this information here at the start? Would you really use the term per inch? I wouldn't. I'm just kind of mentioning that that's what it is if you have heard the term PSI before. Because most, like, Car shops and tire pressure gauges measure a PSI, just for instance. When they tell you PSI, this is what they're describing. Okay. That answers the question. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, now, this is technically a new formula, so I like to get a little practice in for each one. I'm going to treat this as our starting calculation, so one newton of force over one meter squared is one pascal of pressure. If we take this surface area and we double the amount of force that we exert on it, so increase from one newton to two newtons, what does that do to the pressure? Double. Double, yes, not a trick. We plug in two newtons instead of one, and we keep the area the same, we get two pascals. So double the pressure usually means double the force. That, in my opinion, feels fairly straightforward. Um, but next, different observation. Let's say that we still only use one newton of force, but we exert it over half the surface area. If I physically cut this square in half, right about there, and I'm exerting one newton of force over this reduced rectangle that is half a meter squared, what does that do to the pressure from our baseline? It'll be half. It actually won't be, and that's because the area term is on the bottom of this fraction. So if we keep one newton the same, but plug in half of the area, so 0.5 instead of one, one divided by 0.5 is actually two. If you keep force the same, but divide surface area in half, you double the pressure. So the smaller an area you exert a force over, the greater the pressure you get. In my opinion, that explains a few things about the human experience on this planet. I mentioned a second ago that your nervous system doesn't detect force your nervous system detects pressure. Human nervous system is very weird in terms of what it can and can't sense. Similarly, you don't sense temperature, you only sense heat flow, but that's a discussion for another day. Your nervous system senses pressure instead of force. Now I know this because your body can't actually detect your own weight at all, because when you're falling, the only time that gravity is the only force acting on you, you feel weightless, correct? It's only when you are standing on the ground and the ground is pushing up on you that you're actually aware of gravity because you can feel the force from the ground pushing up. Yet that's what you're actually feeling. And that force is always applied over a surface area because it's either the bottom of your feet or whatever part of you you're sitting on. So you don't really feel your own weight. You just feel pressure from whatever surface you're standing or laying on. But I feel a better example is I'm going to take my hand, and you're, wel you're welcome to mirror along with this, but just be warned, if you do it the wrong way, it could hurt. I'm going to take my hand and just press down on the surface of the table. So I'm exerting force onto the table, and that force is exerted over the area of my hand. Again, not a standard shape, but you could find that flat area. So there's a certain amount of pressure here right now. Now, without changing the force I'm exerting, I am going to reduce the area that that force is acting on over by switching from my palm to just one fingertip. Same amount of force over the dramatically reduced surface area of just one finger. And this suddenly starts hurting. Does that sound familiar? Human sense of touch, and therefore pain, doesn't detect force, you detect pressure. And that is why this doesn't hurt, 
but a medical injection does, even if it's only using the same amount of force, because needles have teeny tiny surface areas, along with any other sharpened or bladed instrument. Super teeny tiny surface area, it does not create a whole lot of force, doesn't require a lot of force to generate high levels of pressure. And that is again why, you know, medical equipment is very good at its job. Related example, are you guys familiar with the physics experiment slash cultural thing of sitting on a bed of nails? All right, one nail you don't wanna sit on. Teeny tiny surface area, you'll hurt yourself. But if you're sitting on multiple nails, so a bed of them, 10 times the nails is 10 times more surface area, meaning 10 times less pressure. And so that's why people can lay on this without hurting themselves. I wouldn't do it, but it's possible. What about when the nails are more spread out, if it was the same amount of nails? Well, just as much as, uh, well, it, it depends. You'd want as many nails as possible in a, in the tight space. Right. If you it want was them more spread out, it wouldn't be covering as many as the right. Body, like, so there would be less surface area. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Like if I very quickly draw a person shape here. You'd want as high a concentration of nails under you at all times, and you'd want them to be evenly spread. Like, you could put a ton of nails under this part of you, but if there's only a very small amount of them down here, your legs will start bleeding, but this part of you will be fine. So, if you did ever want to do this, you'd want as many as possible and evenly spread. I suppose you, well, you might want to prioritize the health of your head, but still, as many nails as possible. As much surface area as possible, let's say it like that. It doesn't even need to be nails, frankly. If you, uh, at some point in my life, I have had to lay across like a series of bars like this, but my body laying on it. And this does hurt, maybe not as bad as, you know, a single needle, but if my entire body weight is just being applied to these surfaces, you know, that hurts too. So it doesn't even have to be sharp objects. I think some chiropractors have you do things like that, and that's why it's not always a fun trip to the doctor's office. So, uh, all that to say, area very strongly contributes to pressure, and pressure very strongly contributes to human experience. Any questions about the first part there? All right, uh, second part. Uh, I wanna use this number real quick, the atmospheric pressure. Barring any sort of weather phenomenon that is uh, messing with this number. This should be the pressure the Earth's air is currently exerting on your body. And since pressure always acts perpendicular to surface area, that pressure is currently exerting forces inward on all of your surfaces. Now, the human body is not one is not a standard geometric shape. You know, we're not cylinders, uh, but you do still have a surface area that you could calculate, and the pressure from the air is going to exert force inward on all of those various surfaces, uh, and that means that we could calculate the force that the atmosphere is exerting on the surface area of a human body. 
Uh, I have estimated my own surface area to be about two meters squared for simplicity's sake. So theoretically, you could take two of these boxes and wrap up every inch of me. What then should be the force from the air on my body? P equals FA, sorry, F over A, that's important. So I plug in atmospheric pressure for P, we're gonna solve for force, and I plug in my surface area for A. And this indicates, I multiply by two to get F by itself, that there are 202,650 newtons of force crushing my body inwards from the atmosphere as we speak. Does that sound right? Okay, if it doesn't, I'm, I'm honestly asking, does that sound like the amount of force that the air is exerting on a human of my size at this moment? Uh, it, it seems kind of unbelievable, at least in my opinion. And again, for scale, a human my size only weighs about 2,000 newtons, so this is literally 100 times more than what I weigh. So, 10 tons. It's a lot, and it sounds absurd, but it is true. I'm going to start talking about how it's true without us noticing. You know, even if you are smaller than me, you'd still have a, a force in the hundreds of thousands of newtons acting on you. The reason that this happens at all is because you are currently submerged in a fluid. This is not a scale drawing, but it's meant to represent you on planet Earth and the air bubble that you are submerged in. We don't usually see the atmosphere from orbit, and that is, again, not to scale, but I've colored it blue so that we can see it. The reason why Earth has an atmosphere is because of gravity. We discussed on Wednesday that all matter, solid, liquid, or gas in this case, uh, is made up of molecules and therefore atoms, and therefore protons, neutrons, and electrons that all have mass, correct? So that means that since the air is made out of molecules, like O2 and N2, etc., etc., that air has mass. And that means air has weight. In my experience, you don't tend to think about that, but the atmosphere literally weighs in something, and that's how Earth's gravity is able to pull on it to physically keep it tied to the planet. If Earth's at gravity was much weaker, we wouldn't have much of an atmosphere, and that's why planets like Mars have much less air. That's, why the, that's one reason why the moon has no air. So Earth's gravity is holding this air bubble down to the planet, and that also means that Earth's gravity is physically pulling this air down on top of our heads at all times. There's a whole column of air above you right now that is crushing you miles of air that is just literally weighing down on top of your head. So that's where this pressure comes from. Literally, the weight of the air is crushing you. So that's a good thing, because bad things would happen if it wasn't there. Um, since you are submerged in air, this force does not all point down. This force points inward on all sides, because you are surrounded on all sides by the air. If the air was only above us, it would crush us and all this force would point down and we'd be pancaked. But since we are surrounded in air, it points inwards on all of your surfaces. And so the net force doesn't all point in one direction. The net force cancels out. Because yes, there's air pushing down, but there's also air and ground pushing up. And there's air on both your left and right sides so all the forces on those ends cancel out as well. So you're not getting pushed anywhere by this force, nor are you being 
literally pancake crush, which is good. However, that still means that you are being compressed all the time by this force, and compression can still take something and, you know, crush a soda can, gets crushed. So my next hypothetical question is, why is this force not literally squishing us, even if it's not acting all in one direction? And the main reason for that is, your body's used to it. Everything that lives on this planet is fully designed around this happening. You are calibrated in such a specific way that this is not an issue for you. You are built around this thing happening to you. Your body has a mechanism that pushes outwards with the same amount of force as the air is pushing inwards. That mechanism is actually tied to your blood flow, I'm led to believe. When your blood pumps, literally it pushes outward on all of your veins and arteries and therefore your skin, and that means that your blood and skin pushes back out on the air as it pushes in on you. So not only is the net force on your body zero, the net pressure on your body is zero as long as your heart keeps beating. So you are built with this in mind. All life on Earth has some mechanism to deal with this constant atmospheric pressure. So this is the norm. And things only get weird when this changes. You might be aware of the dangers of deep sea diving. Sound familiar? Not only are the dangers wild animals, but the biggest danger is just the pressure. Because when you go down underwater, there's now more fluid around you, but it's also a denser fluid. Water pressure increases very quickly when you start descending into the ocean. So if you go down underwater, the amount of pressure squeezing your body increases. And unless you go very slowly and only to a certain maximum depth, that inward pressure becomes more than your body can outwardly counteract and you get So the bottom of the ocean is dangerous for several reasons. The opposite of that is what happens when you, instead of going down, go up. Because if you scale a mountain, there's now less air above you. Again, not to scale. But on top of a mountain, you'd be up here, and therefore there's physically less atmosphere above your head. Therefore, there's less weight of material above your head, and that's why air pressure drops on top of mountains. Might be familiar with your ears popping, or possibly getting short on breath as you scale mountains. Less air pressure, also less air. So air pressure decreases the higher up you go, and eventually, if you just leave the atmosphere all the other, there's just no air pressure anymore. And that's when you get those scenes in movies where someone in the vacuum of space just explodes. Because your body can't turn off its mechanism for counteracting the pressure. Like, your blood's gonna keep pumping as long as you're alive. So if you suddenly just remove all the air pressure, your blood keeps pumping, your body keeps pushing outwards, even though there's nothing pushing inwards anymore. So suddenly, the net force, the net pressure points outwards and your body tears itself apart. Explode like in movies. So, not only is the bottom of the ocean dangerous, space is dangerous. We were built for the surface of this planet, and we probably shouldn't leave it, either up or down. Make sense? So, you don't notice it because you're built around it, your nervous system is designed around it. It's calibrated in such a way that you don't notice it, which is good because if I could feel all that force, it would probably drive me nuts. Questions thus far? Okay, so um, this discussion has been referencing the fact that when you are submerged in a fluid, that fluid exerts pressure on you. We've looked at the definition of pressure, but now there's a different formula that I want to show you for how to calculate the pressure 
that the fluid exerts on you. When you are submerged in a fluid, and that's any fluid, air, water, or other, whatever your pool is filled with, the, flu the pressure from that fluid is equal to the density of the fluid times the strength of gravity on this planet, so that is the G that represents negative 10 meters per second squared, but this formula does some weird vector math. It doesn't care about the negative sign. It doesn't care about the direction because the vector for a pressure is either inward or outward. It doesn't care about up or down. So this formula has absolute value brackets in it around the G to get rid of the negative that's normally attached to that negative N. This formula doesn't care about the negative. Does that make sense? A lot like the GPE form to go that way. Uh, anyway, fluid pressure equals fluid density times G times the depth of the fluid. How much fluid is currently above you whose weight is now pressing down on you? And that's why the G is there, because the pressure depends on the weight of the fluid that is above you. depth to an image. Depth would be the height of fluid above your position. If you wanted to know the, say, water pressure on your head, you'd determine the height of the column of water above your head. So depth is always the amount of fluid above the point that you are examining. Does that make sense? All right. And again, you can use this formula for uh, pressure within any fluid. You can use it for water pressure, but we're going to work an example like that in a second. Uh, you can also use this formula to double confirm atmospheric air pressure, basically. This number, the atmospheric pressure, can be derived using this formula. You just need to know the density of air, the strength of gravity on Earth, and how much air is above you. Questions about the formula itself before we practice it a little bit. All right. So, I mentioned you could use this for water pressure if you are underwater. So, let's put some numbers to this picture. You are three meters below fresh water. In a, let's just say you're in a freshwater pool and you're three meters down. Your head is three meters beneath the water's surface. That's about 10 feet. So that's actually a pretty deep pool. As long as you know the depth, the strength of gravity on your planet, and the density of the water, which is very commonly just 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed, you can determine the water pressure acting on you using this formula, so I'll just be specific here, pressure of water is equal to density of water, 1,000 times our, the magnitude of gravity on this planet, 10, again, we don't care about the negative sign, that's why the absolute value bracket is there. And our depth is three meters down, therefore the water pressure at this depth my unit for a second there. It's 30,000 pascals. Which is already about 
a third of atmospheric air pressure. 10 feet down, and you have increased the total pressure on your body by 30%. First of all, any questions or issues of determining that number? Okay. I'm actually going to skip around this a tiny bit real quick. Because first, I'm going to ask, what happens to that water pressure if you go down twice as deep? You're six meters down instead of three. It doubles. Yeah, if you double the depth within the fluid, multiply in double the number, you get double the pressure. So again, the further underwater you go, the uh, very quickly more dangerous thing you get. And uh, again, I'm kind of jumping around this particular slide. I want to point out that going underwater does not get rid of air pressure doesn't get rid of the standard atmosphere. You may not be surrounded by air anymore when you're in this pool, but the pool still is. Going underwater, the air is now pushing down on the water, causing the water to push down harder on you. So this number does not represent, these numbers, plural, depending on depth, don't represent the total pressure on your body, they just represent what the water is adding to the pressure on your body. Does that make sense? Going underwater does not get rid of the 101,000 atmospheric pascals, it's just adding on to it. So if you were ever asked to calculate the true pressure, That is just a fancy way of saying what is the total lump sum of all the pressures that are currently acting on you, which is normally atmospheric pressure plus any additional modifiers that are being added on to it. So at this depth, the true pressure be 131,325 pascals. Again, going down to this depth of water, the air pressure doesn't go away, we're just adding this much water pressure to it. Which again, contributes to why the further down you go, the more pressure acts on you, the more likely you are to get crushed if you are not very careful. At the 60,000, uh, at the six meters down, if the water pressure was 60,000, the true pressure would increase to 161,325 pascals. So at about 10 meters down, you've doubled the air pressure already at just 10 meters. Any further than that, and you're eventually going to triple and quadruple the pressure on your body. And again, at that point, things start getting this contributes to the bend, which is what happens when you're being crushed. It affects your blood flow. It affects uh, the size of the bubbles in your blood. Well, I guess the real issue is when you surface too fast and the bubbles expand too quickly. The point is, the ocean is dangerous. Questions about that? Okay. Uh, last concept question related to this. I was using the density of fresh water for this calculation. Salt water is more dense than fresh water. That is because there is extra stuff added into the salt water. There's physically more matter per gallon of salt water because it's physically filled with salt in addition to the water. So salt water density is higher. It's usually about 1,025 kilograms per meter squared. So not a lot, but it's still more dense. So my last concept question related to this. If this was not a freshwater pool, if this was salt water, what would happen to these pressure numbers? They'd increase. They'd increase. The denser the fluid, the bigger the pressure number you would get. So 
Denser fluids create more pressure, which is another reason the ocean is scary, because the ocean's made of denser types of water. Not only is salt water denser, cold water is denser, and the ocean's pretty cold, all things considered. Um, this is one reason why water pressure is so dangerous apart from air pressure. We need air pressure, and it takes miles of air to generate atmospheric pressure. But 10 meters of water can create the same amount of pressure because water is thousands of times more dense than air is. Hypothetically, you could swim in an even denser fluid and the pressure would increase even faster, although I wouldn't recommend swimming in mercury for other reasons. Questions? All right. That's actually all I wanted to get through today. So just to kind of mention what we will talk about next time. Um, Monday, and therefore lab next week, are going to be about how all this affects floating, the science of buoyancy. Any questions for right now? All right, I don't know if you have any. Um, normal lab next week, and have a great day. And weekend, have a great weekend.